Welcome to the countercurrent multiplier system found in the kidney, specifically within a structure known as the nephron. There's about a million nephrons per kidney, and it happens in conjunction between the loop of Henle, which we talked about last class, the collecting duct, and a special blood vessel known as the vasa recta. Uh, full disclosure, it's Corona Spring 2020. I'm in my kitchen, Matt Halter, giving you yet one more lecture. And the countercurrent multiplier system, admittedly, is probably one of the most challenging things I learned as a student when taking human physiology, and certainly one of the more challenging topics to teach within human physiology. So we'll try to break it, break it down into smaller components to make it more user-friendly. Okay, so the countercurrent multiplier system is related to the concentration of urine that we produce. We can produce concentrated urine or we can produce dilute urine in anything within that spectrum. Concentrated urine is suggesting we are concentrating the urine with solutes and a lower volume of water, and that can have an osmolarity anywhere from 12 to 1400 milliosmoles per liter, whereas dilute urine, which is clear urine, has a low solute content and a higher volume of water, or a greater volume of water. And that can be as low as 50 milliosmoles per liter. So Urine can be anywhere along the spectrum from a dilute urine of 50 milliosmoles per liter to a concentrated urine of 1,200, maybe even 1,400 milliosmoles per liter. Okay, now one thing I will suggest is that, let's go back there a little bit. Um, one thing I will suggest is that the countercurrent multiplier affect the countercurrent multiplier system. The goal is not to create concentrated or dilute urine. The goal is to help direct or allow for water reabsorption when we need it. Water reabsorption is important for maintaining concentrations of ions within our extracellular fluid and our intracellular fluid, and it's significantly important in maintaining blood pressure. Without proper blood pressure, we have inadequate perfusion of oxygen, nutrients, hormones throughout our body. So it's really about retaining water when we need it. We cannot retain water without the work of the countercurrent multiplier system, nor can we retain water without what's known as a hyperosmotic renal medulla. And the hyperosmotic renal medulla is the goal of the countercurrent multiplier system. It causes the renal medulla, which is the interior of the kidney, which we looked at last week, the interior of the kidney becomes saturated with solutes. Hence, it is hyperosmotic. And that is where reabsorption of water from the collecting duct is going to occur. So if we create a hyperosmotic renal medulla, then that's going to allow us to reabsorb water. There's some other factors involved, such as antidiuretic hormone, which we will discuss next class. Uh, starting our slides, what we see here are three vials of urine. On the far left, the clear one is dilute urine. It's dilute, let's just suggest it's around 50 milliosmoles per liter. <clears throat> and it has a low concentration of solutes. The one on the far right is concentrated urine. It has a high concentration of solutes. Concentrated urine is created by the reabsorption of water. When our nephrons, specifically our collecting ducts, reabsorb water, they put the water back into our bloodstream and not into our urine, and that creates concentrated urine. If our 
cardiovascular system or body in general does not need the water, let's say we have excess water in our filtrate running through our nephrons, we can get rid of it and we create dilute urine. Okay, this is a slide we looked at last class, all the components of the nephron. Really what we're focusing on today is everything below this red line. Above the red line is the periphery of the kidneys, known as the renal cortex. Below the red line represents the renal medulla, also known as the interstitium. And what we're focusing on is the loop of Henle, which we see right here. And the activity of the countercurrent multiplier system occurs with the loop of Henle and in an associated blood vessel known as the vasa recta, which we will talk about. But it is both functionally or spatially and functionally related to the collecting duct that we see over here. We are going to create the hyperosmotic renal medulla in this whole area, which will allow for the reabsorption of water from the collecting duct when needed. Okay, so this is the bulk of our lecture, this slide right here. This is showing the loop of Henle and it, in green, and in red we see the vasa recta, which is a very important capillary that is dipping into the renal medulla along with the loop of Henle. For now, I want to disregard the vasa recta. It's super important, but let's just focus on the loop of Henle. So we see up here at the top left, this is where filtrate is entering the loop of Henle. Over down what is known as the descending portion of the loop of Henle. The filtrate will then proceed down the bottom and then superiorly up the ascending portion of the loop of Henle. So we have a descending portion where filtrate is moving inferiorly and an ascending portion where filtrate is moving superiorly and will eventually enter the distal convoluted tubule. One thing we'll notice in this picture is that the descending portion of the loop of Henle has water leaving it, moving from the loop of Henle into the interstitial space or into the renal medulla. And that is because it is highly water, the loop of Henle, the descending portion of the loop of Henle is highly permeable to water. So water leaves the descending portion of the loop of Henle. When we look over on the right side to the ascending portion of the loop of Henle, water is not permeable. It cannot cross across the tubule cells to get into the renal interstitium. But solutes can, and that's what we see. Solutes are leaving the ascending portion of the loop of Henle, and it is these solutes that are going to make the renal medulla hyperosmotic, highly concentrated in solutes. As we notice in the top left again, we see the number 300, then down to 600 and to 900. Those are representing the osmolarity of the filtrate. The osmolarity of the filtrate entering the loop of Henle is about 300 milliosmoles, which is isoosmotic with filtrate that's created in the renal corpuscle, certainly also isoosmotic with blood plasma. But is the descending limb of the loop of Henle loses water, the filtrates in this portion of the loop of Henle starts to become concentrated in solutes until we get to the very bottom and it's hyperosmotic. It has a osmolarity of about 1200 milliosmoles. And that is all due to the departure of water from the descending portion of the loop of Henle. Now, this is pertinent because the goal of having water leave the descending portion is to concentrate solutes, which will allow for solutes to move into the renal medulla or into the interstitium. Now, truth be known, the solutes will move both passively and actively, 
depending on which layer of the tubule cells they are crossing. And once again, we'll cover that next class. But as the filtrate moves superiorly up the ascending portion of the loop of Henle, we notice that as solutes leave, it is decreasing the osmolarity of the filtrate up to the point where when it leaves the loop of Henle, it's about 100 milliosmoles as it enters the distal convoluted tubule. So the solutes are entering the renal medulla, making it super concentrated or hyperosmotic. Theoretically, there is a problem with this water. The reason the water is actually incentivized to move into the renal medulla from the loop, from the descending portion, is because of that hyperosmolarity. There's a lot of solutes in the renal medulla and water is attracted to that. But if we just allow water to move into the renal medulla without doing nothing else, it is going to wash out or dilute the renal medulla, which we do not want to happen. Keep in mind, if we look over here, 1200 milliosmoles, that's what we want the osmolarity to be in the deepest region of the renal medulla. So somehow we need to get rid of this water that is entering the renal medulla and we need to get rid of it fairly quickly. And that is the role of the vasa recta. The vasa recta is a specialized capillary dipping down into the renal medulla adjacent to the loop of Henle. And as we see, the currents or the flow of blood through the vasa recta is counter to the flow of filtrates in the loop of Henle. So we see that on the right arrow going up here, arrow going down here, and over on the left. These arrows are going opposite directions because the filtrate and the blood are moving in opposite directions. So if we focus on the right side here, as solutes leave the ascending portion of the loop of Henle, they're going to start concentrating this area here, which is the interstitium. But like we said in the, in the outset of this lecture, the interstitial fluid and the blood plasma are isoosmotic with each other because they essentially share the same contents. So these solutes, which are concentrating the renal medulla or the interstitium, will also concentrate the blood plasma. That is why this flow of blood, and this is a low volume of blood flowing into the renal medulla, becomes more concentrated as it moves inferiorly in the vasa recta. So concentrated that at the bottom, it has the same concentration as the loop of Henle and the same concentration as we see in the deepest part of the renal medulla. And it is becoming concentrated because it is gaining solutes that have left the loop of Henle. So we go from 300 all the way down to 1200 at the bottom of the vasa recta. And it's that highly concentrated blood plasma in the vasa recta that draws the water in to the bloodstream out of the renal medulla. So as you may see here, I am showing two arrows here where water moves into the renal medulla and then immediately into the vasa recta. So the goal of the vasa recta is to pick that water up from the descending portion of the loop of Henle so the renal medulla is not washed out or made dilute.